We're starting a new series this morning that we'll be pursuing through the month of December. And the name of the series is Through Mary's Eyes. And today's focus is Through Mary's Eyes, It's Not a Fairy Tale. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Let me expand on why we're going to try to examine the conception and birth and childhood of Jesus through the eyes of Mary. Is because I think that in the evangelical world, Mary has been sadly neglected. In an attempt maybe to distance ourselves from what we perceive as an undue emphasis from Roman Catholic friends, evangelicals have said, we're just going to go the other way and ignore Mary completely. Just treat her like anybody. God didn't. God didn't. I want to submit to you that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the greatest woman who ever lived. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the standard for womanhood, the standard for femininity. She is the model for ideal womanhood. She was, of all the women who ever lived, not only on earth and in the history of humanity, but in the history of the nation of Israel in particular, because the promise of a deliverer was to Israel uniquely, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, she was handpicked by Almighty God to be the mother of His Son. And to put it in a southern vernacular, that is tall cotton. It amazes me why Mary is neglected as a standard for all young girls to be taught what it means to be a godly woman. I would submit to you, if you are of the female gender, I would submit to you that you are cheating yourself by not studying carefully what the Bible teaches us about Mary, the mother of Jesus, learn from her, and apply the qualities of her character to your life as a standard for what God desires in women. Now we're going to, in light of this, we're going to look this month through the, in the, in the book of Luke at the birth of Jesus, through the eyes of Luke in that regard. Why are we doing that exclusively in Luke? Well, first of all, we're doing that because Functionally, we're going to begin, begin a series that is going to last throughout 2013 in the writings of Luke. We are going to be looking in 2013 in Luke and in Acts, the two books that Luke penned. We're going to be looking in Luke throughout the year, and we are going to emphasize next year the ministry of prayer and the Holy Spirit as is emphasized by Luke in his writings. So next year is going to be a year of prayer in the life of Deltona Alliance Church. And that's going to be our focus and our highlight throughout the year. And we're going to begin a little bit of a head start by looking at the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And that's not accidental either because Luke gives us more information about the birth of Jesus than any other book. Following that thought, there's a second reason that we're examining the birth of Jesus through Mary's eyes in the book of Luke. And we're going to be doing that for the reasons that follow as I share. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we read these words as Luke introduces his book. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, 
Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Luke gives us a clear introduction to his story of the life of Jesus. A much clearer introduction than Matthew, Mark, or John give us. He tells us why he's writing, and he gives us the name of the person to whom he's writing. He's writing because he wants to give a thorough, complete account of the life of Jesus to this man, Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is like many words in the Greek language. It's a compound word. And it's a name that quite simply means God lover. Theos means God, and philia is one of the words for love. It has to do with um, friendship and affection. So it's God lover. And it was a common name in that time. Many people in the Greco-Roman world were named Theophilus. So he was evidently a man, as he was addressed, most excellent of some high rank or importance in Roman society. Having said that, Luke is essentially writing to give him a clear understanding of who Jesus is. So I don't know if Theophilus was a believer or if Luke was writing this to lead him to Christ. Either is possible. But Luke, we know from Paul's writings, because we'll see momentarily that Luke was a close friend of Paul's, Luke was a physician by trade. So he was a person who was, who was familiar with careful investigation as a doctor. Furthermore, there's another unique characteristic of Luke. Luke stands out among all the other authors of the Bible, of all the 66 books of the Bible, of all the authors of the Bible, Luke stands out unique in one critical way. He wasn't Jewish. He's the only Gentile writer in the whole Bible. All the other books of your Bible, New and Old Testament, were written by Jews. Luke was a Gentile. Now, having said that, let's explore this a little bit further as to why Luke would have a unique perspective on the birth of Jesus and why the series is entitled Through Mary's Eyes. Now we're going to look in Acts, briefly look in Acts, and we're going to look at chapter 16 of Acts. Now remember, we know that Luke was an associate of Paul the Apostle who was a famous missionary and traveled throughout the Mediterranean world and wrote most of the books in our New Testament. And we find these words in Acts 16 verse 9. Acts 16 verse 9 says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after we had, he had seen the vision, immediately watch the pronoun. We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us pronoun us to preach the gospel to them. Notice he, in the narrative, Luke stops talking about he or they and he starts using the personally inclusive pronoun we and us. Now you're going to see a map that we're going to put up on the screen in front of you. And I know you can't see details, don't worry about it, this is just a general rendering. This would be in Acts 16 during Paul's second missionary journey. And he traveled throughout um, Asia Minor, over into Macedonia, Greece. Here's Corinth, here's the Aegean Sea, here's Italy over here, the Mediterranean down here. And it's in this region right here that we discover in Acts that the he and they sections disappear and the we sections begin. So Luke was residing in this area in northern Macedonia, north of the Aegean Sea. 
And both on Paul's second and third missionary journeys, the we sections begin there. So it's obvious that as Paul traveled through that region, Luke joined the missionary company. Now, furthermore, this is relevant through Mary's eyes. Bear with me. If we go to chapter 17, verse 1, notice again, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Notice that they begins again at the end of chapter 16. However, if we go over to chapter 20, and now we're on the third missionary journey, Paul's last missionary journey, and we'll see a second uh, look at that on the map. It's again, you, you see he's back in these same areas again, traveling, Paul is, for the second time. It says in chapter 20, verse 5, These men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Philippi is right here. The Aegean Sea is right here. Troas is right here. Again, Luke picks up with Paul and his companions, and he sails then back with them as they make their way back to Jerusalem. And Luke, at the end of this third journey now, stays with Paul even back to Jerusalem. Now, having said that, Paul the Apostle gets arrested in Jerusalem because he is accused of violating the laws of Moses in his preaching of Jesus as the Messiah. Paul gets arrested and imprisoned by the Romans. Because he was a Roman citizen, that caused problems for the Romans. They had to have legitimate charges against him. So ultimately what happened is that Paul's nephew, Paul had a nephew, he overheard a plot against Paul's life. He warned Paul that some of the radical Jewish opponents were going to capture him and kill him out of Roman imprisonment. So the Roman leaders got word of this, and they sent Paul, we'll look at the next map now, they sent Paul down here to Caesarea. You can still go to Caesarea by the sea. They sent Paul down here to Caesarea for a prison. Now listen, in Acts 23, it says that while he was there, several of the Roman um, civil authorities heard Paul and asked for information from him, and he defended himself to them. And in 2335 of Acts, it says, he said, speaking of the Roman authority, I will hear you when your accusers have also come. And he commanded to him to be put in Herod's praetorium. Now, we're going to see a picture. This is a picture of the ruins of Herod's palace in Caesarea as it exists and looks today. This is the sea. Caesarea was a major seaport on the Mediterranean for the Romans. And this is Her the ruins that are still left of Herod's palace. So these rocks, uh, you can, this was the pool they had out back on the veranda on the Mediterranean. These Romans knew how to live. And uh, these are the ruins of the gardens and so forth. And that's still there today. Back in the 90s, I was with a tour group in Caesarea, and we were several hundred yards up the shore from these ruins, and someone just happened to point out the guy that down there are the ruins of Herod's Praetorium where Paul was a prisoner. And so I broke away from the group. I said, we're not going down there. I said, man, I want to stand where Paul was prisoned. So I ran down the beach. And there was guys standing out here on the end of these rocks fishing <laughs> off of the ruins of Herod's palace. And I just walked around down there. And that's where we find that Paul was imprisoned. Listen to this, Acts 24, 27. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, Felix and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Now, I, I want you to bear with me. What I'm trying to lay out for you is the we sections in Acts and the itinerary of Paul's life in Acts and Luke's companionship with Paul, he was with Paul during those years. Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea over two years. So what did Luke do for two years? He researched 
as he told us in chapter 1, he researched the information for his biography of Jesus. Now, let's take that to another level. This would have been about 60 AD. Mary, the mother of Jesus, we don't know how old she was, but she was probably a, a, a teenager, 14 to 16, maybe 17 years old, when she bore Jesus. So we don't know anything about the history of Mary's life beyond the early years and Jesus' life. The last mention that we have are early in the history of the church and at the crucifixion of Jesus. But it stands to reason that Mary could have lived to a ripe old age and still been living when Paul was in prison. And it's very possible that Luke could have interviewed her personally. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But I will tell you with absolute certainty that if he didn't interview her personally, he certainly had access to her first-hand memoirs of the birth of Jesus. Why? Because if you read Luke 1, 2, and 3, the detail is, is phenomenal, and the things that are shared could have come only from Mary. In fact, twice it says, Mary treasured these things in her heart. Who knew that except Mary? Nobody but God. And Mary knew that. And the phenomenal detail, as we'll see in the weeks to come, of the birth of Jesus are things that only a mother could have known. So Mary had a unique perspective on the incarnation of God through the person of her son, Jesus Christ. Mary had a unique perspective on the birth of Jesus. And Luke records Mary's perspective. So in these weeks, let's let Mary preach Jesus to us. Are mothers proud of their sons? Typically so. You think Mary was proud of Jesus? I do. I think she still is. <laughs> and the record of that is found in the Gospel of Luke. So let's let Mary brag on Jesus for a few weeks and hear from her about her son, our Lord, our Creator, our Savior. Now, with this background, let's bring this to an application. With this information that we've looked at, let's bring it to an application. How many times have we heard the quote-unquote Christmas story? How many times throughout our lifetime have we heard the story of Jesus' birth? How many times have we sung the familiar songs, some of which we've already sung this morning? And I would submit to you that familiarity can cause us to grow in our lack of appreciation for the facts. And I would submit to you that most of us, many of us at best, most of us at worst, really treat the story of Jesus, especially his birth, functionally like a fairy tale. Because the way we approach Christmas is with a sentimental romantic attitude and we look back and we winsomely remember and we think about experiences and so forth and so on. And oh, by the way, we're all supposed to be happy, right? Isn't that what we're told? Do you know that Christmas is one of the greatest times of depression for so many people? Because everybody says you're supposed to be happy. Well, what if our memories aren't pleasant memories? <laughs> What I'd like for us to do through Mary's eyes is get real this year about Christmas. Let's get real about it. Let's see what the Bible has to say. These were real people. This was real life. And in reality, they were no different than you and me. Just imagine through Mary's eyes. You're a young girl growing up in a small, unimportant village 
in a backwater province of the Roman Empire and you get a visit from something or someone that's amazing, an angelic creature, as in Gabriel, and this angel says, you're going to be pregnant. And she goes, what? What are you talking about? Imagine the stigma attached with it. This was a small town. People know how people get pregnant. <laughs> and it's not supernatural, typically. Would you agree? So imagine that this... And then, and then there's Joseph. She's engaged to Joseph. What's he going to think? Am I going to be ostracized? A am I going to be sentenced to poverty the rest of my life? And then Joseph... God blesses him with an angelic visitation. Imagine how confusing this is. You know, we've got in mind that the Messiah is coming, but Lord, this wasn't what we thought would happen. And Joseph is straightened out by the angel, but then it comes up to the time for Mary to deliver. And oh, by the way, it just so happens that Caesar orders a census. Lord, is this how you, if this is how you treat your friends, I hate to see what you do to your enemies. You mean I've got to take this woman that I'm married to that's pregnant in ways I'm not even sure I understand how, and now I've got to cart her 100 miles or so, uh, whatever the route is, to, to Bethlehem, and she's about ready to deliver? And then they get to Bethlehem, and guess what? Go away. We're full. God, am I really... Have you ever in your life thought you were following God and nothing worked out the way it was supposed to? If I'm Joseph that night, I'm having a, I'm having a, a, a sincere sit-down with God. You know, you've called me to do something here that I'm, I'm really confused about, and nothing seems to be working. And then, the only place he can find for his wife to deliver is a cattle stall. Anybody ever been in a cattle stall? I have. It's not a sanitary place. But that's how God chose to let His Son be born and to bring deliverance to the whole human race. And what I'm trying to say is that once we catch the reality of this situation, we can put our life in perspective because my concern is that so many times we gloss over these things and we sing Silent Night, Holy Night, like they're all sitting around with their hands crossed singing Kumbaya and everybody's happy. I'm telling you what, it was... A terrifying experience. And life with God is not always predictable or easy, but God, in spite of that, does amazing things. And as you walk with Him by faith, don't expect it to be a bed of roses, because it's not going to be. But as you trust Him, look at Mary as an example he will do things with you that you never dreamed possible. Now, having said that, let's look at some scripture and let's draw it to a close. Luke 1.1 1, 1 kind of brings it together for me. When I discovered this, even after I had finished preparing the message, it's one of those aha moments and I had a little party. Luke 1.1 1, 1 says something interesting. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Uh, I read earlier from the New King James, it says about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now, anybody ever heard of the word pragmatic? How do you use the word pragmatic? You use it in a context, hey, well, let's, let's be pragmatic about this. What's that mean? Let's, let's stop pretending. Let's not act like we're in a fairy tale land, right? Isn't that what you do when you say, let's be pragmatic? Let's get down to brass tacks. Let's deal with reality. Isn't that the way we use that word? Well, in the original, in the Greek in which Luke wrote, the word reads like this. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the pragma, the pragma that have been fulfilled among us. You see, what Luke is saying is exactly what we're saying this morning about the birth of Jesus. Let's 
It's not a fairy tale. Let's get facts. These are real people living in real time. And it's real life. And that's exactly what Luke is saying to Theophilus about the whole story of Jesus. You see, the Bible is a book that records real human history. This is not a fairy tale. You see, what we do is we say so many times, Oh, you can't prove the Bible scientifically. You can't prove you came to church this morning scientifically. Again, to remind us, in order for something to be proved scientifically, what has to happen? It has to move from hypothesis to theory to law. And how does that happen? Well, there's an idea that somebody has as they have observed something, and then they try to search for evidence to develop a theory about what might be the case. But in order to move from theory to law, it has to be repeatable and observable in a controlled environment. Right? So history cannot be proved scientifically because you cannot repeat it. I don't have a time machine, do you? But there is such a thing as historical verification. We know that Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. We don't have any videos. We have some still pictures. But that still doesn't prove he was president. How do we know? Because of historical verification by cross-reference of documents, etc., etc. We know that Caesar was ruler of Rome because of historical verification. You see, when we're talking about faith in Jesus, we're not talking about a baseless faith. We are talking about believing a reliable historical record of people who really lived and of things that really happened. That's the reason Paul emphasizes in Corinthians that Jesus' resurrection was witnessed by 500 people. I'm telling you that any lawyer would take a case if he has 500 witnesses to confirm his case. So our faith is not a blind faith based on conjecture. It is faith based on real facts of real history of real people that is completely verifiable historically. But my question is, how many claiming to be Christians in America treat Jesus Christ as a mythological figure and the Bible as some sacred legend? like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And some nebulous character in history that might be nice to talk about, but it really doesn't have anything to do with me and my life today. I'm going to tell you that He is real, and it has everything to do with your life today. Everything. Luke was a real man who interviewed eyewitnesses. Luke was a real man who interviewed eyewitnesses. Mary was a real woman who had a real baby. Jesus was a real man who had a real mother and a super real father. And I would submit to you that that changes everything forever. And John the Apostle understood the importance of this. Listen, in fact, you could read with me if you want to. It's going to be on the screen in front of you. Let's read these words of John as we prepare to go to the communion table. You see, because he even gives us a tangible reminder in the bread and the cup. We're going to touch that with our five senses. And Jesus gave it to us as a reminder of his reality. And notice what John says. Notice the language that John uses. John, 1 John chapter 1. Read with me. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
That life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Notice what John says. I'm not talking about fairy tales here. I'm talking to you about what I have heard. One of the five senses, ears. What I've seen, another of the five senses, eyes. And with what I've touched, another of the five senses, feeling. This is something that I'm talking to you about that's real. That's history. And I pray that we don't treat Jesus like a fairy tale. Jesus is real. And I would leave you to close with this question. And that's this question. What about your life? I'm grateful that you're here today because that, that's a good start. But what about your life betrays the fact that you really believe Jesus is real Monday through Saturday? Amen.